Hello everyone, today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss the lava lizard. So let's jump right in. In episode 24, we are leaving the mammals and joining up with the Sauropsids at 320 million years ago in the late Carboniferous, forming a clade called Amniota, meaning that the offspring develop in an amniotic sac. A fresh reminder, our last tale took place 180 million years ago, and we're now almost doubling that. There are no living species with whom we share a common ancestor that lived in either the Triassic, which lasted from 201 to 252 million years ago, or the Permian, which lasted from 252 to 299 million years ago. Think about that for a moment. During those intervening 140 million years, there was only a single line of descent that eventually gave rise to the mammals. Lucky us. That amniote common ancestor we share with birds and reptiles looked a lot more like a lizard than a mammal. So you might be wondering, are there intermediates connecting mammals to that common ancestor? The answer is a triumphant yes, and we're going to break these ancestors down into three categories, cynodonts, therapsids, and basal synapsids. These groups are collectively popularly termed the mammal-like reptiles, even though it is just as correct to call them the reptile-like mammals. Really, neither term is accurate, as mammals are the clade encompassing monotremes, marsupials, and placentals, while reptile isn't technically a clade unless we allow birds to be included alongside crocodilians and lizards in this category, which would make reptile synonymous to the clade Sauropsida. This is an issue with how the traditional usage of many taxonomic terms are paraphyletic, which refers to instances where descendant species or taxa are not considered members of the larger taxon from which they descended, which doesn't make much phylogenetic sense. The same problem applies to the term fish, as we'll see much later on. Reptile traditionally refers to scaly amniotes, but not all reptiles are more closely related to each other than to non-scaly amniotes. For example, crocodiles in the archosaur group are more closely related to birds than they are to snakes and lizards. All of those would classify as diapsids, though, based on the twin skull opening, or fenestrae, for muscle attachments distinctive of their lineage. But before any of them were on the scene, there was another group, the synapsids, with only a single opening. Dimetrodon, Edaphosaurus, and the other scaly amniotes that gave rise to mammals fall in that category and are, of course, more closely related to mammals. To abbreviate, the amniotes split into two major clades, Sauropsida, which includes birds, crocodilians, lizards, snakes, and all their extinct relatives, the second clade that includes all extant mammals and their extinct relatives is called Synapsida. Now we are going to meet our increasingly distant ancestors, and if you like reading, I highly recommend two books on this subject, The Rise and Reign of the Mammals by Steve Brusat for the detailed paleontology, and R.J. Downard's Evolution Slam Dunk on the often wacky story of how evolution deniers try to work their way around all of that. As we discussed last time, the common ancestor of all extant mammals had three middle ear bones, one lower jawbone, fur or hair, milk-producing mammaries, and laid eggs. The immediate ancestors of mammals also had these characteristics, but that will soon change. We'll first look at the jawbones, since they represent a near-perfect case of transitions from the original condition to the mammalian condition. The mammal condition is possessing a single lower jawbone called the dentary, which articulates with an upper jawbone called the squamosal, and three middle ear bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes. However, the original condition, which is still seen in reptiles and amphibians, involves possessing several lower jawbones, importantly the dentary, angular, and articular, with one middle ear bone, the stapes. So, how did our ancestors go from one condition to the other? The short answer, the articular became the malleus, and the quadrate became the incus. The quadrate, angular, and articular bones all shrank, while the dentary enlarged to become the only lower jawbone. And yes, we have fossils that span this entire transition. 
As a 2018 paper points out, quote, while still appearing to function as a jaw joint and viable for sound transmission in cynodonts, for example, Thernaxodon lyrinus, Probanignathus, and Probalicidon sanwinensis, the post dentary bones gradually reduced in size and shifted away from the jaw joint, probably for more sensitive hearing. This trend resulted in all basal mammalia forms, for example, Sinoconodon rinii and Morganucodon oleri, possessing a remarkable dual jaw joint with two seemingly functional joints, a quadrate articular joint medial to a mammalian dentary condyle and squamosal glenoid hinge. More derived groups and crown mammals eventually lost the ancestral quadrate articular joint, close quote. Indeed, the characteristics of stem mammals like Haramiavia are so similar to crown mammals that this taxon has been lumped in with mammals in past phylogenies. Moreover, the fossils demonstrating the jaw-to-ear transition were specifically predicted by paleontologists decades before their discovery. As Downard forcefully writes, quote, When the little synapsid fossil Diarthrignathus, or two-joint jaw, was found in 1932, it got its present name in 1958 when Arthur Crompton did a full systematic description, its jaw layout exactly matched the prediction Robert Broom had made back in 1912 when he deduced what an intermediate jaw structure had to have looked like to link reptiles and mammals, and Crompton named it Diarthrignathus brumi in his honor. Close quote. Further developmental studies have shown that, just like the articular and quadrate in sauropsids, the malleus and incus start as a single cartilaginous condensation that subdivides into the separate bones and the gene BAPX1 is involved in the development of both the articular quadrate joint in fish and sauropsids, as well as the malleus incus joint in mammals. There is a clear downward trend in size from therapsids to cynodonts, and the cynodont ancestors of mammals remained small while pseudosuchians and dinosaurs dominated terrestrial environments during the Mesozoic. The selective pressure that drove miniaturization is unknown, but it may be related to endothermy and ecological specialization as insectivores. During miniaturization, cynodonts consolidated their cranial bones both to reduce jaw joint stress and strengthen their cranium. However, as jaw joint stress is reduced, so is bite force. Researchers found through biomechanical modeling that the best way to reduce jaw joint stress while also retaining bite force is to evolve a smaller overall size, which cynodonts obviously did, and by moving the articular and quadrate out of the jaw, this freed them to be co-opted for conducting sound in the middle ear. Technically, these bones could already conduct sound in the jaw, so their exaptation as ear bones was more of an optimization for this function rather than the evolution of a novel function. Now we pull slightly out from the cynodonts, which appeared just before the Permian-Triassic extinction event, to the larger clade Therapsida. The Permian-Triassic extinction event was primarily caused by a province of supervolcanoes called the Siberian Traps, which erupted continuously for two million years. These volcanoes put out enough carbon dioxide to cause a greenhouse effect that raised the temperature of equatorial oceans to a lethal 40 degrees Celsius, or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. A recent hypothesis has added that the volcanoes increased the amount of nickel available for microbes to utilize, so this material that formerly limited the growth of archaeans that produce methane, called methanogens, allowed the archaeans to experiment with new biochemical pathways. One such biochemical pathway, called acetoclastic methanogenesis, cleaves acetate to make methane and carbon dioxide. Phylogenetic analyses of archaeans that perform this pathway, such as methanosarcina, show that this metabolism evolved during the Permian-Triassic extinction. The increased amounts of carbon dioxide and methane caused widespread ocean anoxia and acidification that resulted in some 81% of marine species and 70% of terrestrial species being wiped out. The three therapsid groups that survived the extinction were the cynodonts, dicynodonts, and therocephalians. Dicynodonts are identified by their two tusks and toothless beaks and ranged in size from small burrowers like cystocephalus to the elephant-sized Lysowikia. By far, the most abundant dicynodont skeleton is Lystrosaurus, which survived the Permian-Triassic extinction and, at some early Triassic sites, makes up to 90% of the vertebrate diversity. Dicynodonts live from the Middle Permian to the end Triassic, when they were wiped out by the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event. 
As for the Therocephalians, they were largely carnivorous and survived until the Middle Triassic, the last survivors of which included Microgomphodon from South Africa. As a whole, therapsids first appeared in the early Middle Permian, evolving from the grade of early synapsids known collectively as pelicosaurs. The origin and rise of therapsids seems to have been linked to increasing global temperatures and seasonality, and therapsids had a gait, endothermic capabilities, and dentition that was transitional between the earlier pelicosaurs and the later cynodonts. These features may have helped therapsids survive increasing aridity that shrank the wet forests pelicosaurs had evolved in, which is why therapsids replaced them. There are six clades of therapsids, Biarmosuchia, Dinocephalia, Anomodontia, which includes Dicynodonts, Gorgonopsia, Therocephalia, and Cynodontia. Biarmosuchians, Gorgonopsians, Therocephalians, and some Dinocephalians like Antiosaurus were carnivorous, while other Dinocephalians like Ulimosaurus and the Anomodonts were herbivores. Though Cynodonts definitely had hair, the extent to which hair covered other therapsids is debated. Maybe they had just whiskers or sparse tufts of fur, but without better fossils we will never know. Molecular phylogenies show that hair originated from the repeated duplication and diversification of keratin paralogs, and that these have further diversified within mammals. Another major characteristic of mammals is lactation, the production of milk via glands. As a 2002 paper argues, Quote, if early glandular skin synapsids kept in close body contact with eggs, as do most extant amphibians with terrestrial eggs, provision of cutaneous gland secretions to eggs could have been an early synapsid trait dating back 300 million years or more. This span is consistent with date estimates for the origin of lactose synthesis and may suggest that a primitive form of lactation is very ancient indeed. The ability of mothers to keep eggs moist while guarding them and to replenish egg moisture losses after foraging trips would have been advantageous long before the evolution of endothermy. Thus, synapsids might have been pre-adapted to the evolution of endothermy by virtue of an established system of egg supplementation, just as the ancestors of birds were pre-adapted to endothermy by the presence of a rigid, calcified eggshell. Although lactation is a defining trait of extant mammals, it may have played a central role in synapsid evolution long before mammals came into existence." Close quote. In addition to cooling eggs, lactation can also provide supplemental water, nutrients, and antimicrobials to offspring. How exactly? Well, it's not uncommon for hatchlings to consume the eggshell after hatching, so perhaps after these early synapsids hatched from their eggs, they also consume lactation that cover the eggshell. Later, hatchlings would consume more of the lactation directly from the parents. Now we've reached the so-called pelicosaurs or basal synapsids, which first appeared in the late Carboniferous. The early Permian and Carboniferous were cooler than the second half of the Permian, and polar ice caps existed. The pelicosaurs dominated the early Permian, radiating into a variety of clades. Eothyrididae, Cassiosauridae, Varanopidae, Ophiacodontidae, Edaphosauridae, and Sphenacodontidae. All of these animals walked much more similarly to sprawling lizards than to mammals. Sphenacodontids, Ophiacodontids, Varanopids, and Eothyridids were carnivores, while Cassiosaurids and Edaphosaurids were herbivores. Interestingly, the sails of Edaphosaurids and Sphenacodontids appear to have evolved independently, possibly functioning in thermoregulation, signaling to conspecifics, or some combination of functions. Pelicosaurs were largely constrained to humid rainforests, which were much fewer in number in the early Permian than they had been in the preceding Carboniferous. This is probably why therapsids, which were not as confined as their pelicosaur ancestors, rapidly replaced the pelicosaurs. The reason for the loss of rainforests was an event known as the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse, which occurred about 305 million years ago. This may have occurred as a result of volcanism triggering global atmospheric changes towards a more arid and seasonal climate, which in turn led to a reduction in rainforests. The change in flora follows a trend from increases in opportunistic ferns, to the loss of the large K-selected lycopods, to an increase in tree ferns. The rainforests fragmented, being surrounded by dry lands dominated by small shrubby plants. The loss of rainforests triggered the extinction of various amphibian-grade animals, including Baffetidae, Colisteidae, several microsaur families, Dendropatontidae, as well as the reptilian morph families 
Gephyrostegidae, and Thracosauridae, and Selenodonsauridae. But amniotes flourished in its wake. Some amphibians did originate following the collapse, such as Areopidae, Trematopidae, and Trimerorachidae. Interestingly, nearly all tetrapods prior to the collapse were either insectivorous or piscivorous, but following it, herbivory and carnivory became rapidly established in many clades. The amniotes with their hard-shelled eggs that could be laid on dry land, and their protective scales for retaining moisture, were poised to inherit the earth. Now that we've reached the common ancestor of all amniotes 318 million years ago, we must ask what exactly separated the earliest synapsids from the earliest sauropsids. If you've watched other videos in this series, then you might have guessed the answer. The shape of their teeth. Mammals have molars, premolars, canines, and incisors, while sauropsids do not. Their teeth, if differentiated at all, have a much smaller degree of shape diversity. So at the base of amniota, the difference between the first tetrapods that would give rise to platypuses, kangaroos, elephants, whales, and humans, and the first tetrapods that would give rise to turtles, lizards, crocodiles, and birds, was a subtle dietary shift. Accompanying that, synapsids developed a hole in the skull called a temporal fenestra that serves as a site of jaw muscle attachments. By contrast, sauropsids evolved two temporal fenestrae. So did sauropsids and synapsids evolve fenestrae independently, or did their common ancestor have one? Evidently, the common ancestor of all amniotes didn't have a fenestra, and then synapsids and sauropsids independently evolved them. At least that's how it seems currently. Due to the great similarity in amniote forms during the late Carboniferous and early Permian, it's really difficult to figure out who's related to whom. Of course, we expect that it would be fairly difficult to delineate these organisms into separate clades when they're closely related to each other. Capturinidae, Protothyrididae, and Areocelida are very basally derived among amniotes, whether as stem sauropsids or maybe stem amniotes. Either way, none of them have fenestrae and all were small insectivores. Another family that keeps switching places is Varanopidae, a clade of carnivores which is sometimes considered a synapsid and other times a sauropsid. Next is Parareptilia, which is a diverse group of reptiles including mesosaurs, milleretids, procolophonids, and pereosaurs. Fossil-driven phylogenies have historically nested turtles as being close to either the armored pereosaurs or the more lizard-like procolophonids. But genetic analyses have tended to place turtles sister to archosaurs, the crocodilians and birds. However, a 2022 analysis made Parareptilia paraphyletic to all the other sauropsids, with turtles indeed nesting as a sister clade to archosaurs. Archosauromorpha includes placodonts, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, pseudosuchians, pterosaurs, dinosaurs, and a host of other bizarre Permian and Triassic reptiles. We did a series on the evolution of dinosaurs from earlier sauropsids and how they eventually gave rise to birds, so check that out if you're interested. Sister to the clade containing turtles, crocodilians, and birds is Lepidosauromorpha, the tuatara, lizards, and snakes. Snakes are actually a subset of lizards, being just one lineage of several with highly reduced limbs. And now that we have finally reached the lizards, we can discuss the lava lizard. Another recurring theme in this series is biogeography, and in this episode we're going back to South America. On the west coast of South America is the Nazca Plate, which is subducting under the continent and causing the Andes Mountains to rise. On the west side of the plate, where it contacts the Pacific Plate, are three volcanically active microplates called the Galapagos, Easter, and Juan Fernandez Plates. The Galapagos Plate has existed for 90 to 80 million years, but the oldest existing islands are no more than 17 million years old. Importantly, the Galapagos Islands are about 960 kilometers from mainland South America, and this proximity has allowed the island to be colonized by a variety of plants and animals. Today, we will cover just one of these groups, the lava lizard. Tropiduridae is a family of iguanid lizards originally endemic to South America. One genus of these lizards is called Microlophus, the lava lizards, which contains nine species and is native to South America and the Galapagos Islands. Unlike some of the more famous denizens of the Galapagos, the lava lizards dispersed to the islands multiple times independently. 
Lava lizards are one of two Galapagos inhabitants considered to have resulted from multiple immigration events, the other being Philodactylus geckos. These lava lizard clades are classified as two radiations, an eastern and western one. The eastern radiation consists of two species, M. bivitatus on San Cristobal and M. habeli on Marchena. As for the western radiation, this consists of seven species that inhabit most of the western and southern islands. Most Galapagos islands have their own unique species. M. albemarlensis is on Isabela and Fernandina, M. pacificus is on Pinta, M. jacobi is on Santiago, M. indefatigabilis is on Santa Cruz and Santa Fe, M. delanonis is on Española, M. duncanensis is on Pinzon, and M. greyi is on Floriana. The eastern radiation originated on San Cristobal, the western on Española. These are the oldest islands of the archipelago. One way researchers know that the islands were not colonized just once is that the eastern radiation lizards form a clade sister to the South American M. occipitalis, the knobby Pacific iguana, which is mainly found in Ecuador and Peru. The western radiation arrived first with the ancestor of M. delanonis reaching Española 4.54 to 1.68 million years ago. From there, populations dispersed to Santa Cruz about 2.2 million years ago, from Santa Cruz to Pinzon about 1.5 million years ago, and from Pinzon to Santiago about 800,000 years ago. A separate population dispersed from Española to Floriana about 1.5 million years ago, and then from Floriana to Isabela about 700,000 years ago. From there, two populations dispersed independently to Fernandina and Pinta about 300,000 years ago. As for the eastern radiation, the ancestral population arrived on San Cristobal between 2.8 and 2.09 million years ago, and simply dispersed from there to Marchena about 400,000 years ago. The point of the lava lizard's tale is that islands possess fauna descended from species that live on the continental mainland, and researchers are able to track how archipelago inhabitants hop from one island to another. We will continue to look at this process in the next tale when we meet the most well-known denizens of the Galapagos. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.